Will you pray with me? Lord, open our hearts and minds by the power of your Holy Spirit, that as the scriptures are read and your word is proclaimed, we may hear with joy what you say to us today. Amen. Our scripture reading this morning comes from Romans 6, verses 1 through 11. What then are we to say? Should we continue in sin in order that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin go on living in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? Therefore, we have been buried with him by baptism into death, so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we have been united with him in a death like his, we will certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him so that the body of sin might be destroyed and we might no longer be enslaved to sin. For whoever has died is freed from sin. But if we have died with Christ, we believe that we also will live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. The death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. When I was a sophomore in high school, I got braces. A sophomore in high school. Because it took me until freshman summer to lose my last baby tooth. I was what you call a late bloomer. I happened um, to be very upset about the fact that I had to get braces in high school. At my new school, by the way, I also switched schools that year to a public school. Um, And my parents, thankfully, took a little mercy on me and let me get the new clear braces that had just come out, the plastic clear ones. I was delighted to have this small shred of dignity restored to me at that time. And uh, so I went to the orthodontist, and he put the braces on, and he said, well, this comes with one little caveat. You can't drink any dark liquids while you have these on. This was like the prototype number one. I think now you can, you know, do better by these. But for me, it meant no Coke, no tea, no root beer, no coffee. Not at all, unless I wanted to have brown-looking teeth on my braces. And I was motivated because it happens that my orthodontist was also my Sunday school teacher. So I was very motivated to, like, not do what he said I couldn't do. He would check on me every week. Um, I loved root beer and Dr. Pepper the most as a sophomore in high school. But um, I gave it up. I didn't want my teeth to turn brown. So I started drinking Sprite. I did not like it. I gave it up and had water. And wouldn't you know it? Uh, Your pediatrician, when they say, like, you should cut out some sugar because it'll be better for your skin, they're right. Because one glow-up that happened is when I took out the root beer and the Dr. Pepper, my skin got better. So it's one perk of having braces. I also had better skin. So 10 months later, I go back into the orthodontist. I get my braces off, and I'm so delighted. And the first thing that I do, the thing I've been waiting for for 10 months, is I go to the nearest drive-thru, and I get the biggest thing of root beer that you can ever imagine and I cannot wait I have been waiting for this moment I take it I take my first sip of this root beer it's going to be freedom and I drink it and I don't like the taste anymore it tastes sugary and syrupy and sweet it almost gave me an immediate stomach ache I was like ugh, is this what root beer tasted like this whole time I didn't drink maybe a fourth of that massive root beer on that day. I had lost the taste for it. The thing is, sometimes you love something, whether it's a job or a relationship or something as trivial as Bark's root beer, and then you fall out of its orbit long enough to realize 
that you don't actually love it at all. We can die to things. Old habits, bad situations, silly distractions. It's not always anything of fanfare or impressive discipline or skill. We just fall out of it, and it dies. And when we look back, we wonder how we were ever so convinced that we needed it so badly. Sometimes, of course, breaking a pattern or making a change takes everything out of us. It costs us immensely. I think of friends of mine in the recovery world or who have been in abusive relationships. And getting out of that harmful orbit took the kind of soul force that I have rarely had to call upon. But there was a thing that became like death to them, and eventually they died to it. And then they were free. And what they felt was a newness of life. We can die to things. That's what Paul is telling this gathered group of Christians in this letter to the Romans. I think he's worried that they haven't quite grasped yet the kind of soul force that they have on hand, the kind they have access to through the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. We are dead to sin and alive to God. And that means that these powerful forces of sin and death don't hold more sway over us, cannot, than the newness of life that comes to us because of Christ. Paul asks, how can we who died to sin go on living in it? And you may want to say, I don't know, Paul, you tell us. Because it seems absurd that he's trying to make it out to be so easy. I don't think he means it's easy. I think he's just helping us know, helping us remember that it's possible. We can die to things. We can die to sin. We can. Because whatever that thing is, when it's attached to us, it's also attached to the risen body of Jesus. We are united in a death like his, and united in a resurrection like his. And that gives us options. When we fall out of the orbit of the death things and the sin things, what we find is that the orbit of resurrection, of newness of life, is right there waiting for us. And Paul says that's because death has no dominion over Jesus, and therefore no dominion, no orbit over us. It means realizing once and for all what does have power over us. And our problem is that we think that sin and death have the most power over us. But they don't. We're not impervious to them. We're not above them. We get caught in their orbit every single day. Death will come for us all. But at some point, we start to realize that they are false gods. That they might have oomph, but they don't have staying power. The thing that has staying power is the life, the resurrection, that newness that is always available, ready to be born in us. I'm a spiritual director, so I think a lot about what it means for people to grow spiritually. And that's my job here at Preston Hollow, too, to think on behalf of this congregation how people can grow and to see if we can figure out how to create the environment for that to happen. It takes God, of course. It's not just willpower and human decision. But also it's not just God. As with all things, God has designed even our own spiritual life to be one of collaboration. And when I think about the way that I see people grow, I think it starts with awareness. One day we realize, wow, this inner critic voice I've got going is really not doing me any favors. Gosh, this anger that's swirling in my stomach is really blocking my sense of empathy and compassion. Wow, this distraction, these habits that keep me escaping are really standing in the way of me being present. And then what do we do? Well, maybe we just think about it for a while. Sometimes we make big plans and we decide to quit this habit once and for all and then You know, a week or so later, guess what? We've totally forgotten. We just drop right back into business as usual. But it's already come to our awareness. So at some point in the future, we remember again. 
And then we think, gosh, why can't I get my act together? And we try again, and we fail, and we feel so frustrated. And what people don't understand is that this pattern, this very frustrating pattern that we all do, it is actually doing something. It may be inches or mere centimeters, but it is moving us and moving something in us. And if we stick with it, one day we will look up, and this habit or pattern we will realize just isn't what we want anymore. We don't like how it makes us feel. We're sick of dealing with it. Just like that, we lose our taste for it. We fall out of its orbit. We die to it. We can die to things. And when that happens, it's because we have, sometimes entirely unbeknownst to us, started living for something else instead. The gentleness to ourselves, the compassion we give to others, the peace and the presence we bring to a moment. These things have, in the best way, taken over. And it's then that the life we live, we live to God. And that life feels like abundance, like relief, and like home. And when we realize that, we also realize our freedom. I was thinking this week about how in high school, the same year I had my clear braces, my friend Lucretia invited me to a Juneteenth cookout. I had literally never heard of Juneteenth before, even though I was a Texas fourth grader who spent that whole fourth grade year learning about Texas history. You'd think that they would mention Juneteenth, but they didn't. On January 1st, 1863, Abraham Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, which declared that all persons held as slaves are and henceforth shall be free. He knew they already were free. He's saying we're going to try to match that in the way we're living here. And as you can imagine, some people were reluctant to act on that, to accept it. Which is why we have to mark that on June 19th, 1865, two years, six months, and 13 days after the Emancipation Proclamation, General Gordon Granger finally arrived in Texas to declare it to people here. He landed in Galveston, bringing 2,000 troops with him to enforce the Reconstruction efforts. Lucretia told me that she grew up hearing stories of her ancestors who spent two years enslaved, even after Lincoln had declared them free. My God, how heartbreaking. How dare we? <laughs> Imagine hearing the news and realizing that you have been toiling and suffering all of this time, all the time, unjustly, and for two of those years, you have even been left out of your own emancipation. Our enslaved siblings in Texas were living in the orbit of freedom, in the dominion of resurrection, and they didn't know it. But as soon as they got word, it became cause for celebration. Juneteenth is a time to celebrate the freedom that is rightfully yours. And it also reminds us that there are people who will deceive you and lie to you and hold you back from your freedom, but they don't own you. They don't own you. You live not in their dominion, but in God's. And God has set you free. One of the Hebrew words for salvation is yasha, which can be translated as being placed in freedom, being liberated. I love that because it feels like it's something personal for us and something so much bigger than us. Psalm 18 says, He brought me out into a spacious place. He rescued me because he delighted in me. Paul says, We have died already with Christ so that we can even now, right at this moment, live with him. We can live in God's dominion. And what it feels like when we start living in that orbit is wide open space. It's the feeling of being placed in freedom. It's what it feels like when we walk in the newness of life. The third century theologian Origen wrote, 
So then let us walk with Christ as new persons and as increasingly beautiful people, uniting the beauty of our face with Christ as in a mirror. It's beautiful when we get free. Paul just wants us to know how beautiful it is, how good it feels to be free so that we will claim what is rightfully ours through the risen Christ. And so we will live for that, for both ourselves and for others. And what is ours is abundant life and salvation that feels like being brought into a spacious place. Sometimes what keeps us from that is forces and systems and structures of injustice beyond our personal control. We know that. And sometimes we keep our own selves from that freedom. And we know that too. Either way, we need God's help, God's deliverance, but also I think what Paul really wants these gathered Christians to know, including us this morning, 2,000 years later, is that there is a, a way in which this life is already ours. We have access right this moment to the same power of life that raised Jesus from the dead. And therefore, it is also our responsibility to live like it, which means helping others get free too. That is soul force that is available to us. I was thinking about Nelson Mandela this week, about all that time he spent in a prison cell. 27 years. I always forget it was that long. 27 years. What was it that kept him going all that time? I can't say for certain, but as he was a person of faith, I think it was only possible for him because he was living in some way like that freedom was already his. He knew that was the real real, and this prison and this apartheid, these were false gods, a limited reality that would one day end. Racism and violence and oppression, they didn't own him. They weren't the boss of him. And he knew it. He knew he belonged to something bigger, something more free and more beautiful. By no means did that make it any easier for him for those 27 years. By no means did that soften apartheid's consequences. What it did mean, though, is that he was willing to be part of a revolution to bring his people into the dominion of resurrected life. The dominion of sin and slavery and oppression and injustice these forces are real and they are evil. But they exist in a world where Christ is risen. And therefore, there is a wider and more powerful dominion that exists. Dying to sin and living to God means that we trust God enough to live from there, even if it's at odds with the world around us. Even when the world chooses revenge, we choose reconciliation. Even when the world chooses anger, we choose love. Even when systems around us treat people like burdens to scorn or problems to solve, we choose to treat them, as Sam Wells says, like mysteries to be entered into. Paul is praying that we might lose the taste for those things outside of God's resurrected dominion. That's all it is. When we lose taste for all those things, when we die to them, we begin to live more fully to God. We begin to live more fully with God. And we become, as Origen said, increasingly more beautiful people. I want to close us with a prayer from Cardinal Newman. Will you pray this with me? Dear Jesus, help us to spread your fragrance everywhere we go. Flood our souls with your spirit and your life. Possess our whole being so utterly 
that our lives may only be a radiance of yours. Shine through us and be so in us that every soul we come in contact with may feel your presence in our soul. The evident fullness of the love our hearts bear to you. Amen.